we have a choice. Every one of us has a choice and we can be broken by that loss or we can mine that pain and become broken open and become better people, become more like those people that we loved and the best of them. We can, we can consciously choose that. People don't feel like they have that choice because grief is so painful and we'd rather avoid it and run from it. But to, to use that pain in some way, and I don't know if it was instinctual, and if we each have that instinctively in us, and some of us are just floundering around, and some of us turn away from all good and all because we're so angry. I, I've met people who are still angry years after they lost somebody that they loved so much, and they're angry whether at the person or at their their life or at God or whatever. They're just that they harbor that anger, and then what a waste of the pain! What a waste of the the loss, if we can use these losses and become better people. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who've started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. Mary, welcome to The Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Thank you so much for having me. It is my pleasure to have you here. So I found out about you and your work uh, because you are a longtime listener of the show and you actually wrote in and told me uh, a bit about the work that you've done around creativity, but also um, some of the things that you written about and talked about when it came to education really kind of caught my attention. Uh, but before we get into all of that, uh, given what I know about uh, the book and your background, I thought I would start by asking you, what birth order were you and what impact did that end up having on the choices that you have made throughout your life and your career? Ooh, I love that question. So I'm number seven in 10 children. I'm not really a middle child. I'm, and I don't know what effect that has on on me as, uh, you know, being kind of at the tail end. I used to think being seven was magic number. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but I think having seen my siblings before me, you know, kind of follow their interests and follow follow their, what what they wanted to do in life, I think that has an effect on the younger children because I knew by the time I was in junior high, I wanted to go to college. I thought I wanted to be a teacher, but I, I soon changed my mind once I got to college, but I, I was determined and we were poor. So that wasn't really a, that wasn't really a possibility given to me by teachers was that I could go to college and I was just determined. I don't know if you get more determined the farther are you down the line with children, maybe. Yeah. Like, okay. So being four and a family of 10 kids, uh, what did that teach you about being resourceful and making your way in the world? And did your parents loosen up in terms of, uh, you know, sort of how strict they were with each subsequent ch child? Because I feel like, you know, I always jokingly say my sister got away with murder in comparison to what I got away with when I was younger. Well, I'm the mother of eight children, and I can tell you for a fact that the first four had a different mother than the last four. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm serious. Yeah, because, oh, my gosh, the rules and all the, I mean what we had with our first children, I think you either get tired or you just relax a little bit by the fourth or fifth one. It's, but yeah, I'm, I can tell you for a fact that my children had a different mother. The first four had a different mother than the last four. Now for my parents, I can't, when I hear stories of my, from my older siblings, it's like, wow, I, I don't know. I didn't know those parents because there is quite a few years between me and my oldest sister. So I, I bet that's true for most families. I mean, you kind of, you said you, you use the word relaxed. Um, could it be in those larger families that you just get really tired? <laughs> I don't know. But uh, and I've heard the saying that the first child's like a pancake. You know, you're, you're testing everything out. You're trying the batter and you make a mess, kind of make a mess of it. I don't know if that's true because I feel sorry for parents who only have one child then because they, you know that that's the practice baby but um yeah my my kids will they look at their younger siblings and say oh you get you get you got away with everything and i don't think that's true i think it's just a little you learn what's important you learn um to pick your battles 
you know, which of these rules are, don't make sense or, you know, even spanking. I spanked my first, I'm horrified when I think about it. I actually spanked my first two and then I kind of didn't like spanking and I didn't spank the, the other children. So they never got spanked. Yeah. What else changed with each subsequent kid? Like, you know, how did you change as a parent? How did you evolve as a parent? And uh, how in the world does somebody navigate the dynamics of a household with eight kids without losing their mind? I mean, I remember my dad and mom, I remember on one of my birthdays, I asked them, uh, I said, do you guys ever think about having a third kid? And my mom said, yeah, I wanted to, but your dad was pretty much done. And he was thinking about doing AIDS research. And he said, I don't want to bring a kid into a world where I'm going to be doing AIDS research. But, uh, you know, that never actually happened. But it just sounds insane to in one way it sounds insane in others i'm almost envious because like i see tv shows like parenthood and i was like man i want a, a family dinner like that like i want to go to a christmas where somebody has 10 you know 10 siblings at the table well i will say growing up in a family of 10 i always had a friend i had a playmate near my age always and so until i went to school i didn't feel like i lacked for anything because there was always somebody to play with and then raising eight children well for, first of all you have them one at a time that's good <laughs> so I wasn't, I didn't have eight babies in the house. I didn't have eight toddlers in the house. And I love, love, love holidays, getting together with my family or um, outside picnics or something and just looking at these amazing adults that um, we managed to raise. And then they become friends too. So it's, I, I loved it, but it was hard. It was very hard. And I was the kind of mom that used attachment style parenting. And that means I wore the baby. I mean, on a backpack or on my front pack. I nursed. I slept with them. I mean, it was just a very, very close relationship. I think it, in the end, probably affected my marriage a little bit because how could it not when I'm giving so much of myself to children? But as for myself, I think I had to hang on to some semblance of creativity. So I graduated from college and gave birth to my fourth child and took finals in the hospital bed after giving birth. And that's when I kind of decided, well, I'm going to stay home with my kids is because I, I now have four of them and, you know, maybe I need to be there for them. But I knew I had to hang on to something, some creative part of myself. And for me, I believe I wrote the first article I ever wrote was when that baby was a, a, an infant. And as soon as I got a $50 check for that, I thought, whoa, this is, this is easy. This writing thing is easy. You just um, write stuff down on paper and you get it, you submit it and you get it published and you get money. But anybody who's a writer knows it's not that easy. <laughs> I kind of lucked out with that first article. I, I think I sent it in. I hate to say this on paper, handwritten on paper. I'm pretty sure. And then I went to typewriter and eventually computer. And I still write my first drafts even to to this day on paper. I just, there's something about handwriting on paper, but I think that's what saved my sanity when I look back is I kept that creative part of myself. I, I don't understand how somebody can say you lose yourself in mothering or you lose yourself in parenting. If you keep some interest or some creative part of yourself, whatever it is, whether it's baking or gardening or, and it doesn't hurt our, our kids to see that either. So yes, I was mostly a stay at home mom, selling articles and, and maybe doing some part-time work at a library or I had lots of home businesses. So it's mostly a stay at home mom, but I always, the kids grew up always seeing a mom who could get lost in thought or could get lost in something. And for me, it was writing. And I never thought that hurt my kids because then they knew that they could follow their dreams, even if they're busy at home or if they're busy with a the job, there's still a way to keep that creative part of yourself. But yeah, I say that saved my sanity sometimes. What's the age gap between you and uh, your siblings? Which of the ones are you, which ones are you closest to, and why? And then same question about your kids. Like, what's the age gap between them? So with my siblings, I think that my oldest is early seventies. It's terrible. I don't know exact ages. Maybe seventy-two is my oldest sister. My youngest is. Um, whoa, we're getting old. <laughs> she's she's cl getting close to 60. So there wasn't this huge age gra gap in my family. My parents sometimes only had 12 months, 14 months between children. For myself and um, my kids, my oldest was 23 when his sibling 
baby sibling, baby sister was born. And so there's, there's that, you know, that's, that's eight in that amount of time. And like I said, those first four kind of had a different mom than the last four. But in my family, you know, that, that, the ones that I'm closest to probably it changes. It changes with their lifestyle. Now, when you're a younger kid, you don't even know those older kids when they leave home. And they, my sister Joan, I didn't didn't know that well. My sister Pat, my brother Lyle, you know, we looked up to him. We thought he was amazing. And we thought our older siblings were amazing people. And then they would come and visit. And they, then they're having children. And I'm still at home. So you don't really know them until later when you develop a relationship. So right now, I'd probably say I was closest to my oldest sister, the sister that I didn't know that well when she moved from home. What about your own kids? What, uh, which ones are the closest to, do you notice any sort of similar things between your own kids and, you know, uh, your own family and your own siblings? So my youngest just turned 18 this last summer and her brother is over 40. And so when we get together, she's just starting to fit in with her older siblings who some of them have started families, some are married. And um, I love watching the interplay between them as they started start to see her as, oh, she's not this annoying little pest anymore. She's actually a human being with, with ideas and a job. And, you know, I love to see that happening. I've got a couple girls who have been best buddies since they were young, and they're still, still very close. But, you know, the relationships change. I, I see the that change in conversations as we, as we're, as they're growing up. So it, it changes just like it did with my family. And I, I'm amazed to see, you know, these adults, these adults, that, but I still see them as kids. Sometimes I still see the, and you know, what's funny is when you um, raise that many children and you see this, these distinct personalities and then to see them as adults and to still see those certain things that you just know are part of them that they were born with. I love I love to watch that too. Yeah. Hey, it's Trini. So one of the things that makes it possible for us to make this show is by selling sponsorships to advertisers. And one thing that would be really helpful in terms of helping us get more sponsors that are relevant to you and useful to you is that if you tell us a little bit about who you are. And you can do that by filling out this quick survey at unmistakablecreative.com slash pod survey. The questions are about you, demographic information, and information that's helpful to the team that sells ads for the show. And if you're someone who wants to buy ads, you should definitely get in touch. It'll only take a few minutes, and it's an easy way for you to help the show. Again, that's unmistakablecreative.com slash pod survey. And there will also be a link in descriptions of the most recent episodes if you're listening to an older episode. Thanks and stay tuned for the rest of the episode. What are the the sort of skills that come from, you know, juggling so many kids that most of us wouldn't think, um, you know, would be applicable to other parts of life? Because I, I always think back to that Sally Fields quote from, uh, you know, brothers and sisters where some you know investor tells her that, you know, she's not qualified to run a business. And she's just like, all right, running this huge enterprise, as you call it, would be a day at the beach for me in comparison to what I had to deal with, you know, raising six kids. Uh, well, multitasking for sure. I mean, and yet they tell us, science tells us that's not so good. We can't do as well when we multitask. But I certainly know how to write no matter what is going on around me. I can go into a crowded cafe and write. I can um, I can write with a lot of noise around me because I learned how to kind of tone that out. Or when I when I had deadlines, like if I was working for a newspaper or whatever. And to this day, the kids know when I'm in my head. They can be talking to me, they can be looking at me. And if I was, if they caught me at the computer or a legal pad of paper, cause I was writing and I'm looking at them and I see their mouth moving and, and I, but they can see it in my eyes. They say, Oh, you're not really listening. Are you, you, you're still in your head, you know? So they can see that they could, because they grew up with that mom. We, we get lost in the things we love. And I got lost in writing a good book too. I can get lost in a good book, but, um, that's a skill because I know people who say, well, I I'll write when the kids are gone, you know, but you know, it's just too noisy in the house or I got to go someplace quiet to write. I got to go to the library where it's quiet to write. I can write anywhere. I can write at a park. I can write in the doctor's office, in the waiting room. I can write. And I do. And I'll pull over to the curb if something comes to me and I'll, I'll write in the car. 
because I carry a notebook with me everywhere I go. So I'd say that's a skill that I got because I was a writer raising children. Um, other skills I've started, I don't feel like I'm qualified to start anything <laughs> or to organize anything, but maybe all those years of organizing children and organizing coupons to save money and stuff helped me have the confidence to start a writer's conference, start a, an annual grief retreat, just these different things that maybe if I hadn't been organizing a family or learning how to save money or, you know, all of that, maybe I wouldn't have that skill set of being able to organize things and keep things organized and order people around. Hey, moms are good at that. <laughs> yeah, especially Indian moms. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, as I told you, I think the thing that really struck me, and this was my you know, sort of hell yes for your story, was the homeschooling thing. And mm -hmm. this is one thing that struck me uh, in your book. You said uh, another milestone memory was in third grade when I missed 36 consecutive school days due to illness and the teacher informed my parents I'd likely have to repeat the grade. I returned to school not only caught up with the work, but once again ahead of the class. My dad helped me with the math, but I learned everything else from reading the textbooks that were sent home with, this, with my sister. I'm convinced those two formative experiences contributed to a disillusionment with the educational system and a foundation for a future homeschool schooling lifestyle. And, you know, you having heard the show know that I have some pretty, you know, strong opinions uh, about the education system, despite the fact that my dad is a college professor. Um, talk to me about the experience of, you know, deciding to pull your kids out of school uh, and how you structure a curriculum that prepares them for, uh, you know, like being successful in adulthood. And then let's talk about the system at large. Mm -hmm. You used a, you used a dirty word. You said curriculum. <laughs> it's not a dirty word, but I was a very relaxed homeschooler. I interviewed a lot of homeschoolers for a newspaper job that I had. And I thought I could never do that. Oh my gosh. They gave so much of themselves and they spent a lot of money and they had shelves of books and sometimes classrooms in their home. They were they were homeschooling exactly like school. And when my, my, oh, my son, Michael, was having trouble in school, it was junior kindergarten. He's pretty much a junior kindergarten drop up. He was changing. His personality, his sweet, sweet little personality was changing. He was starting to hit his sister. And I didn't know what was going on. You know, kids have to go to school, right? And he'd cry when he had to go to school. And when I went to the first parent teachers conference and she said, I know you're worried about him because he's so shy, but he is out there on the playground hitting and kicking with the rest of the boys. My heart dropped. I thought that's why I sent my son to school is so he can learn to hit and kick. And I went home and I looked at that little boy whose personality had changed completely. And I thought I am going to take him out of school. He's going to be a junior kindergartner dropout. And I called these homeschooling parents and I asked, how did you do this? And then I got a hold of a magazine called Growing Without Schooling, which is no longer around. But And I poured over those. I got back issues and I poured over them. And I thought, whoa, there are so many different ways to homeschool, just as there are so many different types of families. I don't have to do it the way those people that I that I interviewed did. I don't have to spend thousands of dollars and make a classroom in my home and use all these textbooks. I can do it. I can kind of gear this around my child's personality. Well, I pulled him out of school. His personality went back to that sweet personality, stopped hitting and kicking. And my older daughter, when she found out I was going to be homeschooling, she says, I want to homeschool too. And my oldest son said, no way. I don't want to be a weirdo, weirdo homeschooler. <laughs> so I started with working with a certified teacher who kind of had the same ideas of, okay, we'll use some real books instead of all textbooks. We'll use textbooks for math, you know, just kind of, kind of put together, we'll use the word curriculum because it is, but when you're not using textbooks for everything, it's real life reading, real life experience. Some of my kids ended up having home businesses, selling t-shirts on eBay or, um, they learned hands-on learning through having garage sales, how to count back change. I just I tried to incorporate real life into everything, real life learning into everything we did. And so I would let them choose the books that they were interested in. Now there's holes. There's holes in their education um, where maybe they weren't interested in this. And so I didn't push too much of that. They None of my kids ever diagrammed a sentence, you know, but you know what? 
I don't diagram sentences anymore, even as a writer. I kind of get the idea and I, of you know where the words are supposed to be and what kind of words you're supposed to be using. So, also, I am a dismal failure yeah. when it comes to well, I mean, I math say everything that you or learned. geography Sorry. because yeah. yeah, yeah. So I learned things and for tests, and that's and that's the way teachers have to teach in school is you have to teach to the test. I learned things for tests. But as soon as I took the test, I let a lot of it just go out of my head because I didn't care about it. So when you say designed a curriculum, really what I did is I took my child's personality. I, and through trial and error, learned what worked and what didn't. Some of my kids were hands-on learners. Others had to see something. Others had to touch something. And just kind of tailored their education towards their interests. And they had a lot of say in that. My one son wanted to read everything you could find about Kit Carson and Daniel Boone and all these different real life stories. And you'd think that he wasn't learning, but he was learning a lot of history in there. And he would read about World War II or Battle of the Bulge. And he just would, loved reading because he was reading what he was interested in. Another daughter wanted to learn about science. And, and you can, we can get the benefit of schools too by dual enrolling and one of my daughters wanted to take some art classes. She took art classes at school, or you can find somebody who will work with them. But my kids became very self-reliant, self-learners. They still are learning. My one son learned by watching YouTube how to blow glass, and he, he does that as a living now. He blows glass. So it's just, and nobody asked them to see their diploma when they went to get jobs. Nobody said, let me see that diploma. They just said, I finished my homeschooling. And I had uh, an employer tell me once that she would only employ homeschoolers because they were self-starters and they, they um, you know, they worked really hard because they, they, they learned to be like that because they're homeschooled. Not that I, I'm not anti-school, and I, but I d did find that when I interviewed homeschoolers and saw their kids, they were different. I mean, sometimes weirdly different, which I didn't necessarily want for my children. But other times they just got along with all age groups because they were so used to being. My kids would go shopping with me. They'd talk to the butcher. They'd order the meat for me, you know, sometimes. And they just, they were comfortable with all age groups. They never had any peer pressure to drink or to smoke or to take drugs when they got jobs. And they were out there in the real world, which, you know, you got to face it. The real world is not the homeschooled world. They were a little bit curious and confused about why these teenagers were so interested in drinking and, and smoking and, you know, early sex or whatever, you know, they just, but they did have interaction. It was important that they did have interaction with other kids. So sometimes we join a homeschoolers group. There was a period of time when we were pretty isolated in the country where a couple of my kids did not have much interaction. And, you know, you, you do need you do need to know how to get along with your own peers. And then when we moved to town, it was easier to join youth groups and that kind of thing. And they all got jobs easily. And some of them haven't since attended college, uh, community college, kind of just following their own interests. But I found it to me, it's fascinating. Uh, it's what I would have loved as a child. I would have loved that little girl who in third grade missed all that school and learned at home could not see any reason why she had to go to school and be bullied to learn because that's another reason probably why I homeschooled. I think, I mean, people ask me that sometimes, was it because you were bullied as a child? Well, not consciously, but I'm sure I thought that, you know, if my kids were square pegs trying to fit in a round hole, homeschooling would protect them from some of that, allow them to be as different as they, they might naturally be allow them to learn reading at their own pace i have a son who didn't learn how to read till he's 10 i was terrified and i talked to the, the, the certified teacher and he said you know what if boys learned how to read at their own speed and their own rate instead of at the same time girls were learning to read a lot of them would be reading later a lot of them would be struggling a little bit more and stuff so part of homeschooling was trial and error and I hope my kids were not this grand social experiment, but they're all turning out really good, and I'm really proud of them. And But it was a little scary to go against the grain and do something a little bit different like that when people were saying, oh, my gosh, you are going to have so much trouble. These kids are not going to have any socialization. You're going to raise a family of weirdos and stuff. And then I saw their kids 
drop out of school or have trouble with school or get involved with drugs or alcohol or peer pressure is so hard for our kids. And, and I didn't see that happening with my children. And I thought I'm doing something right. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, you've mentioned peer pressure and, and sort of socialization multiple times. And that was, you know, sort of your question is that how do you create, you know, sort of the social experiences of things like going to prom and, you know, things that not that I went to prom or any of that stuff because I wasn't cool, but um, those kinds of sort of quintessential experiences that, you know, the typical American teenager has uh, when you're homeschooling children. And then what parts of this did your children absolutely hate? Uh, well, I went to prom and I have to ask myself, did I, would, did my kids miss something by not going to prom? Uh, I, I don't know. Yeah, they missed an experience. Um, but it wasn't necessary. Not all of our socialization experiences are good for our teenagers. And if I, if I could be a part of helping them avoid some of the peer pressure that I'm glad for the homeschooling. Um, the kids did not always like mom telling them what to do, obviously. And some parents won't homeschool because they think, oh my gosh, my kid's not going to listen to me. But I think because mine was more of a relaxed homeschooling, you know, you, you got to do this, you got to do these math problems. But, you know, if you want to read that book instead of um, doing this, and science experiments is another thing. They missed out on that. If they were really interested in biology and wanted to cut up a cat or a, that's what I did in high school. We, we had to cut into a cat in my biology class or a frog or an eyeball or something. I probably would have made sure that they could do that at a school or dual enroll or, or set something up like that. But nobody really expressed an interest in something like that. And I didn't see any of them headed towards medical careers. Because I watched, I watched my kids. I knew their strengths. They they learned their own strengths. So if, if there was a part, there was a part of me that always wondered, am, am I taking something away from my kids by giving them something, by giving them something, something else, which is freedom, freedom to learn at your own pace, freedom to learn through your own interests. And I would say, I don't know if they would agree or not, that the one thing is those children that were out in the country isolated, those 10 years that we were pretty isolated, I think would say it was harder to, to learn how to talk to their own peers, to learn how to get along with their own peers. The son, the son I said that read the Kit Carson stuff, I mean, he would spend hours in the forest. He'd take a can of beans, a pan, and his dog, and a book. And he'd walk out in the woods and he'd be gone for hours and he'd cook the beans over a fire. And I mean, that's the son who ends up making a blowing glass. I mean, he just, and I don't think it hurt him because his personality was fine being alone. He's, he's fine spending 60 hours a week blowing glass and selling on Etsy. Um, but maybe, maybe some of my kids have a little bit of trouble with socializing with peers. You know, but when we go out in the working world, our peers are not everybody our own age. And um, so it, maybe they have an advantage in that way that they can get along with a 70 year old woman just as easily as a 30 year old woman because they they learned how to do that. But I've never actually gotten complaints about their homeschooling experience from them. I'm waiting for it. I'm waiting for the, the counselor therapist bill that blames me because, <laughs> because I homeschooled them. But I think they knew where I was coming from and we talked enough. And that's another thing. Homeschooled kids, they hear their parents. They know everything that's going on in that home. They, they learn the adult problems and the, you, could, you couldn't hide anything from them. So when their dad got cancer, I couldn't hide that from them. And they knew and they were part of all of it and they you just learn a set of skills maybe it's just it's just a whole different world it's a homeschooling world I realized that when my husband died and I thought I can't homeschool anymore because he did a lot of the math and I'm gonna have to put these kids in school and at the time I was working with a uh, certified teacher who was also principal of junior high and he said um no this would be the worst time in the world to send your kids to school because they just lost their dad and then you're going to take away the only lifestyle they knew, knew or know and I realized then that this life 
homeschooling was a lifestyle. It was a, a way of living. It wasn't just a form of learning. It was a way of living. And he also said that those junior high kids would eat them alive because that's the worst time in the world to, to be in school is in junior high if you don't fit in. It's yeah. junior high. It's brutal. Mm, yeah, that, that is one part of my uh, my youth I would happily never relive. Um, mm-hmm. I think that basically, I, I think you know, being a, a, an adolescent is one giant identity crisis in which your parents turn into the most horrible human beings on the planet. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, it, one final question about the the homeschooling piece: mm-hmm. What aspects of the way that you teach in a homeschooling lifestyle do you think could be incorporated into traditional education? to make it more effective? I don't think any teacher in a classroom of 30 students can possibly teach to a child's interests. I mean, kudos to a teacher who tries, and I do know teachers who try, but you have the curriculum, you have the textbooks, and you find out that this one child loves um, painting. Well, you're not going to let them go paint when you have to learn math or or another child has this natural gift for something, you you can encourage it as a teacher as much as possible, but you the classroom would be a huge mess and you would lose con- complete control of your classroom if you tried to teach in a classroom the way a homeschooler might be able to. I knew homeschoolers who would teach exactly the way school was. It's 50 minutes of this, 50 minutes of that, 50 minutes of this. Okay, now you get recess. Okay, now you come back in and you get lunch and now it's 50 minutes of that. And I always wondered, what's the point? What was the point of bringing your kids home and giving them the exact same experience as school? And it was usually religion. They wanted to put religion into every single um, every single topic. And I mean, there was a whole set of textbooks that my first certified teacher wanted me to use. And I was looking at them and I was thinking, wait a minute, this math book has Isaiah and Moses. And um, <laughs> why are you pushing that into your math textbook? I don't get it. I didn't. So I didn't, I didn't um, homeschool for purely religious reasons, but some people do. I mean, I have faith and faith is part of my life, but it was not. So I'm kind of amused by that. It's, well, first of all, why are you teaching exactly the way school is? Because there's no point. And why are you using this curriculum that probably going to make your kid run away from God someday. Uh, <laughs> oh, I well, shouldn't have said that, should I? <laughs> no, that's fine. Well, it, but it, the, kind of, it, it's, it can be ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, well, I, I'm glad you brought up faith because I did you know, want to ask you about that because you do make numerous references to God uh, in your book. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what role does faith play in your life? Probably since my husband <clears throat> passed away in 2012, faith has become my lens the lens I look through the world at through faith. I look I look at everything through my faith. So when I looked at creativity, I looked at the creator. When I speak on grief and well not I mean I can speak either way. I can speak from faith or I can speak from my my certified grief certification. But I look at the great healer when I talk when I do grief retreats. I look at the creator when I talk about creativity. So it's it's a huge part of my life. So much so that when I went on a dating site, I kind of limited myself to only those people who only those men who had that same kind of faith and and ended up with a wonderful, wonderful man who was seeking what I had and didn't already have it. So it's 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 just it's just a huge part of my life. And it's, I think it's because after my husband's death, I developed a personal relationship with God, which I never had. I mean, I, I was raised Catholic and I went to church, and but I never had a personal relationship. So, so you know, this was, you know, something that really struck me in the book uh, that you said about the loss of your husband. You said, losing the person I loved most in the world. The man who'd relished living after a bout with cancer in 2006 gave me a renewed appreciation for life. I'd lift my face to the sunshine, closing my eyes and soaking in the warmth. I'd savor the breeze in my hair when biked to the cemetery and the smell of fresh mown grass. Every scent seemed sharper, every color more vivid. I'd gasp at the beauty of a rainbow like 
the young bride who used to view her laundry drying on the clothesline, I'd watch the sunset on the horizon and get up, then get up, you know, early to see it rise. Mm -hmm. That struck me so much because, you know, it's not, you know, what people would expect as a reaction to something as painful as losing your significant other. And one thing that I I think that I've made this observation about grief before is that I could read every book on the planet about losing a parent, losing a loved one. And I don't think that anybody can ever truly understand that until they've experienced it themselves. Um, But why is it that some people respond this way to grief and others, you know, let it just demolish them? And and I still feel that way. I still can look at a rainbow and, and just be in awe. and. That it, that appreciation came from fire, uh, from grief. Not just my husband, but I'd lost my mother 17 months before that. I lost a grand, eight-year-old grandson 17 months after that. And I studied grief. I studied it like it was a test I had to pass because I thought, you know what? We've got to be built to withstand this because we're all going to lose somebody. So I studied it and I delved into the science and and I realized, and then I became certified as a grief counselor, we have a choice. Every one of us has a choice. And we can be broken by that loss, or we can mine that pain and become broken open and become better people, become more like those people that we loved and the best of them. We can, we can consciously choose that. People don't feel like they have that choice because grief is so painful and we'd rather avoid it and run from it, but to, to use that pain in some way. And I don't know if it was instinctual. And if we each have that instinctively in us and some of us are just floundering around and some of us turn away from all good and all, because we're so angry. I, I've met people who are still angry years after they lost somebody that they loved so much. And they're angry whether at the person or at their their life or at God or whatever. They're just that they harbor that anger. And then what a waste of the pain. What a waste of the, the loss. If we can use these losses and become better people that um, and then probably, yes, having a husband who's gone through cancer, who came close to dying and watching him appreciate life. I remember before his 60th birthday I said are you dreading this birthday you know with that zero because I sure dread those birthdays with zeros and he just looked at me and said no think of the alternative Uh, oh yeah the alternative is not being here so I get up every morning and I have a lot of things to be thankful for because I have met somebody and remarried just this year and I just get up every morning and I think, what can I do today to help somebody out? What, what, who am I going to meet today? What exciting thing is going to happen today? Or what exciting thing will I see? And I just live like that. And I think that's the way we're supposed to, I think that's the way we're supposed to live. And how much better to, to live like that. But yeah, I think it's a conscious choice. And people don't like to hear that. Because yeah. that means we have some work to do when we lose somebody. But maybe we have to figure out how we're going to live without this person. But how else are how are we going to use this too? How are we going to use this loss? How can it make me a better person? How can I live a life that this person would be proud of? But I'll never forget the way that felt when I was. Well, first of all, I'll never forget the way it felt to be not so busy with just one child that I could watch laundry dry, and to just stand there being so happy because those diapers um, in the wind would smell so good and feel so good that I would actually go in the house as a young housewife and look for more things to wash so I could hang them out. (laughs) And I think I had that again when my husband died. I had that period of time when I knew I was going to be okay. I didn't have to go out to work for maybe another year. And I could choose, consciously choose. And not all of us can do this. Um, I could consciously choose to do only those things I wanted to do. What a life um, I had for those. Yeah, I was grieving, but I could, I, I didn't do anything I didn't want to do. And I only said yes to those things. And we could get away with that as grievers too. We can, we can get away with doing things differently or, and I just said no to anything I didn't want to do. And yes, to lots of workshops, lots of 
public speaking and, you know, talking to people and the things that make me come alive. Yeah. You mentioned that you were married and um, you, you met somebody else. How do you open yourself up enough to meet somebody else after, you know, somebody who is clearly the love of your life has passed away um, and also honor the person that was once there while falling in love with another person? Mm-hmm. I, I think COVID and the isolation of COVID really did me in uh, because I went home from work and worked at home for about seven months and went home to the only child of my eight children who did not hug. And so all of a sudden I went from being out there in the world where you're at least getting a handshake or a, somebody, since I was doing grief events, there was always hugs with grief events or I was doing writers conferences and there's always a lot of hugs at those writers conferences and stuff. So all of a sudden I was in a place where no, I was, nobody was touching me. I, I had no touch and my daughter didn't even want to talk to me. She was, 17 and oh she didn't want to talk about the virus she didn't want to you know listen to she wanted to go to work and I was telling her I think I you you need to stay home because you're out there as a essential worker and I'm here at home working to protect myself and so I made her quit her job for a month and until they started wearing masks and stuff and up until that point I knew in my heart that I could love somebody else because my husband had said, if I ever died before you, I would want you to get married again. I would want you to have somebody to hug and to hold hands with. And you know, he's because I know how much you love that. And I needed that. And I did. But I thought, you know, I could, I had it once. I could die without ever having it again. At least I had it. But boy, the pandemic did me. And, and I heard in Iceland, they were um, hugging trees to alleviate loneliness. And so I tried to hug in the tree across the street at the school across the street and just felt like a fool. I mean, hugging a tree and just ran back in the house. And I thought, well, that's not going to help me any. I I started to think about dating sites at a time when, of course, you couldn't see anybody anyway. You'd have to stand six feet apart in a park with, with a mask on. But my heart was open. My heart was open to being loved again. And then I went into the woods where I'd grown up. And my son had bought that place. And I hugged those trees. And those trees felt different. They felt friendly. They felt loving. And I thought, oh, you know, this is, you know, this is something. I can hug trees. And that gave me the idea to take walks with my daughter. She would take walks with me. And in the woods, she would talk. In the woods, we got close. And so I at least got close with my daughter. Something wonderful came out of the pandemic. And it was that closeness with the daughter who's now 18. And I did sign up on a couple of dating sites and, oh, there's lots of weirdos out there. So I would get off them as fast as I could because I think, oh my gosh, no, this is not it. I had a very stringent idea of what I wanted and I wrote it down in my journal. And um, actually in 2018, I had felt led to write a prayer about the husband that I would have someday to him. And I don't know why, but I just felt led to write this prayer in my journal and summer of 2018 so yes my heart was open to that and I thought it probably be, would have to be a widower because that's the only person who would ever understand that my first husband was going to be a part of my life forever you love somebody they're a part of your life they're the father of your children and they're just that love would be there and this man answered this ad and oh their first date was just two hours long and I felt like I'd known him forever and I thought, could this be? And the next day, it was nine hours long, and I found out his wife had died in the summer of 2018, or right before the summer of 2018. I thought, whoa. He said it was the worst summer of his life. And I thought, hmm, I was praying for somebody who I did not yet know in the summer of 2018. And so after that nine-hour day, we both thought, oh, my gosh, this, this is this person who we could love again. And we got married. Um, just uh, probably six weeks after we met, which sounds crazy. But once you've loved and lost and you would give anything to have an hour back with that person and then you find somebody, you'll give anything to have every hour with that person. And he and I are, I mean, our love story is amazing. And we both feel like our former spouses might have had something to do if there's a possible, if there's any possible way, had something to do with bringing us together. 
And so we got married in the woods where I had been hugging trees all alone the year before. Mm, wow. So for both of you, is there ever this sense of, you know, how is this person ever going to live up to the person that was the love of my life? I mean, you know, obviously there's, you know, clearly the person was your father, your children. And I'm guessing for your husband, new husband as well, who, you know, like somebody who was his wife for so long. Uh, is there ever the sense that, you know, like you'll never live up to that, you know, his wife and he'll never live up to your husband. And the cool thing is they don't have to. Because it's a whole new le- relationship. It's a whole new love. It's it's different from the start. And we can talk about our former spouse without the other person being jealous because we both understand. And so I don't think there is ever, he doesn't have to live up to that person. He's a whole new person. And our love is so different. I will say this because I am a faith-filled person. Before that nine-hour date, I had to ask him, I had to ask this man that I'd seen only once for two hours, would you pray with, pray with me? And he said, yes, immediately. And we, we started every, every single day with prayer. We start every day of our life with prayer. And I didn't do that with my first husband. I was 19 years old when I got married, barely knew what I was doing. I was a a kid and um, wish I had. I don't know if that's why. This love is so different, but I think it might be. I think it might be because we've had God in it from the start, and it's just so different. We both marvel at it, and we don't feel like we're doing something against our former spouse by loving so much in such a different way. It's just like it's this is this is something so different. Yeah. How did your children react to it? Hmm. <laughs> it's funny because the last four of my eight, the ones who lived with me. When their dad died, reacted, I think, most accepting. Even that daughter who just turned 18. Maybe because they saw the grieving mother. Maybe because, and they saw her so intimately because they would hear me crying in the night. And they saw the loneliness more than the older four did. And the older four are fine now. I mean, they've met him. They love him. But there was like, oh, what are you doing? <laughs> Type thing. And... um but those last four also saw the faith-filled mother, the mother that changed with grief. And so they knew I was coming from a place of faith and that I had prayer and all of it and stuff. So now they're good with it. He loves cooking. He owns a restaurant, so he cooks. And I don't, <laughs> maybe that won their hearts over. I, I remember one of my kids saying, boy, mom, you need to find a man who cooks <laughs> because I didn't like cooking anymore after my husband died. So, um, and not that, not that his food won won them over, but I, there's definitely that that made him a little more acceptable. But also seeing how much he cares about me and stuff. But yeah, and I don't blame him. If I had one of my daughters tell me after the second date, I love this person, I would say, ah, uh, you know what? You can't know that after two days. And yet here, their mother is doing that. So it had to have been scary for them. It had to have been scary. It was scary for me. I thought this can't be, you can't know after the second date that you love a person. And yet I knew and he knew. And so it's been amazing from the start, but it was terrifying. It was terrifying for both of us because we thought, um, you know, it doesn't work this way. And then somebody who I call my spiritual mentor said, Hey, why are you surprised? That's exactly the way it works when God's in it. That's what I knew the day I met my wife, that she's going to be my wife. He says, that's exactly how it works. And I thought, oh, okay. I didn't know that. He says, trust your feelings. And I'm glad I did. Yeah. You may have read it. There's this really beautiful book uh, titled, uh, My Wife Says You May Want to Marry Me. And uh, the guy mm-hmm. ended up writing the book because right before she passed away, his wife wrote an op-ed in the New York Times titled, You ah, May yes. Want to Marry My Husband. And I remember seeing the story and I immediately picked up the book and I thought, wow, this is such a, a beautiful story. Uh, it really struck me. But yeah, I mean, I think you're right. Oh, yeah. What is funny to me is like, yeah, if a 19 year old said they're in love with somebody after a second date, I'd oh, be like, yeah. you're out of your damn mind. <laughs> you're crazy. Exactly. <laughs> but, you know, I think if you're like, you know, like later in life, it, it, I've noticed mm-hmm. that with a lot of people, like when I hear friends who are, you know, in their 30s or for, like late 30s or 40s getting married mm-hmm. and they're like in six months, they're engaged. I'm like, yeah, at that point in your life, you know yourself well enough to know that, you know, this is going to work or not. I was really worried about my youngest daughter because she was. Um, she had just turned 18. And I said, um, 
well, she for her 18th birthday, she wanted to go visit her sister in California. So she gets on an airplane and I, I tell her, well, I'm meeting this guy this week that I've been corresponding with. And she said, good, you won't be bored then. And then she goes away and she flies and she's back in a week. And I sit her down and say, I'm marrying, I'm getting married. <laughs> I mean, how terrifying would that be to be 18 years old? And And she said, well, you're getting old. You better hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah wow well you know it's it's funny because we've kind of danced around the idea of creative work even though your book is about creativity but I, to me like mm-hmm. this was the part of the story that i really wanted to hear the part that i knew i would never get to hear uh just from reading your book but there's something you say towards uh the middle of the book and i think it, it will make a really sort of beautiful place to wrap up you said most of us will probably not make a living from our creative endeavors there's a reason i keep a day job which offers its own opportunities for creativity and innovation some readers will have been fortunate to discover a purpose in life during their youth others will have struggled for years to become what they are meant to become, holding down dead-end jobs or fighting frustration as they valiantly attempt to stoke that tiny flame that burns within. Then there are those facing the tail end of life, restless with certainty that there is so remaining, like my mother and great-aunt Christine, already incorporate creativity and faith in every part of their lives. Um, you know, it's like you said, I think that we both had a, a very similar idea, you know, behind our books. Uh, mm-hmm. So, why is it that you know people have this idea that if they can't make a living from it, that it's not worth doing it? And how do you, you know, like make a case for changing their mind, given your experience? So often, younger people don't, they follow a career that will make them money. And it, sadly, our society is kind of to blame for part of that because we're telling them you got to make a living and oh you can't be an artist you'll never make a living or start starving or struggling artists or you can't we're telling our children the world is telling our children you got to get a job and you got to make your money well you do you do have to make money and you do have to make a living and stuff and so we abandon that creative part of ourselves instead of trying to grasp and hang on to it so many of us life raising children, jobs, it just pulls us and pulls us. And then where's the leisure time? There's maybe no leisure time. And we think creativity belongs with the leisure time. And we'll do that when we're retired or we'll be, although I've heard people say it's too late for them, too late for them now. I've heard women in their seventies or eighties say, oh, it's too late for me. And then women in their twenties saying, well, I'm too busy. We've got to realize that science is behind putting creativity into our lives and we'll be happier, we'll, we'll be healthier. And so it's worth our time to fit our creative selves into that. And we were designed, we were designed, science shows that we were designed to be creative. We are built to be creative. And so if we can work that into our jobs or work that into the way we're parenting our children or work that into our, quote, leisure time, which most of us don't have, we're going to be healthier and happier for it. And we have got to stop valuing creativity for monetary means because how many of us are going to have paintings in a museum or even what my mother did, wood carvings that we could sell or beautiful quilts or, you know, flowers in the garden that are amazing and win awards. You know, that's, there's a value to being creative in our everyday life. And the value is that we will we will be healthier and happier for it. Wow. Uh, well, this has been really just poetic. Um, so I have one last question for you, which I know you've heard mm-hmm. me ask. What do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? Unmistakable. Oh. When you see, when I hear somebody talk and I see the light in their eyes, I know that. That is what they were created to do. I have met people who are in the dead end job or in a job for the money. And then I hear them talk. It was just recently a woman about the cupcakes she made for her daughter's birthday or something. And I saw this light come on in her eyes. And I thought, oh, that, that is it. That's what makes you unmistakable is what you love. Do what you love. Do more of what you love. And if you can find a way to make money with it, all the, all the better and stuff. But yes, that it's what. We were built to do, and we have to look to our childhoods for that sometimes. That's what makes you unmistakable, what you were designed and built to do. You might not be doing it right now, but that's what makes you unmistakable and find a way to do it. 
Wow. Um, well, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to join us and share your wisdom and your insights with our listeners. This has been really beautiful and thought provoking and eye opening as I expected it would be. Uh, where can people find out more about you, uh, your work, your books and everything that you're up to? You can find me um, on marypotterkenyon.com or on Facebook, Mary Potter Kenyon, Instagram, Mary Potter Kenyon. My book is available at any bookstore or on Amazon or for the Familius Company or Workman Publishing. Awesome. Well, um, like I said, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to join us. Uh, and well, thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. And for everybody listening, we will wrap the show with that. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Unmistakable Creative Podcast. While you were listening, were there any moments you found fascinating, inspiring, instructive, maybe even heartwarming? Can you think of anyone, a friend or a family member who would appreciate this moment? If so, take a second and share today's episode with that one person because good ideas and messages are meant to be shared.